Today's episode is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Keep watching to learn how you can get three months free. Saab was founded by 16 aircraft engineers. The steering wheel acts primarily in an advisory capacity. Riata by Buick, the premium American two-seater you can be comfortable with. As if the cars I featured in my last list weren't bad enough, here are 10 more sports cars and luxury cars for the 80s to mid-2000s that were sales swaps, and their makers probably would like you to forget. Because you're sitting there thinking, that is the most stupid-looking car I have ever seen in my entire life. If you haven't already seen my previous top 10 list, check out that episode as well. Tell me it'll produce 228 pound-feet of torque. I don't know what that means, but I like it. Some of the cars featured here were from suggestions of cars I should have included in the first list. Also, for those of you who saw that episode and wanted to know when you'll see an episode on my Plymouth Prowler, that episode is being planned as well. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful princess who wanted a little more magic in her life. So she went to see the wizard and asked him what to do. Get a Katera, said the wizard. Number 10, Cadillac Katera. I featured this car in its own episode over a year ago. And for those of you who lived through the 90s, you may remember this car not so much by how it looked, but instead by how it was advertised. In the early 80s and early 90s, Cadillac was unable to shake its image as an old person's luxury car and its previous attempt to build a competitor to sports sedans like the BMW 3 Series resulted in a car that may or may not show up later in this list. So for their next attempt, they figured that if American buyers preferred German luxury cars, then that's what Cadillac's next car would be. Back then, General Motors also owned a brand called Opel, which was sold in Europe. One of the models sold there was the Omega, which although in European terms was classified as an executive car, that didn't mean it was a luxury car. In fact, the Omega was probably more comparable to the Chevy Malibu in terms of intended buyers. European cars were always smaller than their American counterparts, and the Omega's size, being a couple inches smaller than a Malibu, could be just right. The result was the Katera in 1996, effectively a rebadged Opel, but built in Germany, which Cadillac hoped would win over potential BMW and Mercedes buyers. However, Cadillac's attempt to attract a younger clientele resulted in a cartoon bird that they nicknamed Ziggy which evolved from the Merlettes in the Cadillac logo. And the bird's name came from the ad tagline. It's the caddy that zigs. Yet despite that claim, its 200 horsepower V6 didn't live up to its promises. And Ziggy's influence in the ads was diminished over the next couple years. Thanks to its far underwhelming response, behind the scenes, Cadillac was working on its replacement, the Katera Touring Sedan, better known as the CTS, which transformed Cadillac's entire design direction for many years later. So much so, the name Katera was quietly retired by 2001, just like poor old Ziggy. Number 9, Subaru SVX. This car is one that I may eventually feature in its own episode, as I definitely remember it from the early 90s, and I have always liked weird cars. This is a car that some of you may not remember, as its production run was only for 5 years. And it followed another odd car from Subaru's 1980s lineup, the XT, which I also did an episode on over a year ago. The XT was a departure from Subaru's more utility-oriented cars, and as such, it never really took off in popularity. Yet that didn't dissuade Subaru from trying to improve on it, this time by trying to move more into the luxury performance market, something they never really known for. The SVX was known as the Alcione in Japan, a Greek name for one of the stars in the Subaru logo, styled by famed Italian designer Giorgetto Giugiaro, whose designs were typically less controversial. The SVX had side windows which wrapped up towards the roof, much like an aircraft canopy. The slope of the glass was so extreme at the top that the entire glass could not be rolled down, requiring a window within a window. Although car design would continue to evolve with more aerodynamic shapes in the 90s, the SVX admittedly looked bizarre, resulting in sales far lower than Subaru clearly expected. Over its five-year run, less than 25,000 were sold worldwide, with little over half of those sales in the U.S. With only around two to 3,000 sold per year in the U.S., they were a rare sight back then, and incredibly rare today making them a forgotten gem of those of us who love weird cars. Ow! Ow, I can't get my head out there. Number 8, Mercure. Similarly to how GM tried to use one of their German-made models to compete in the luxury sports car market in the U.S., Ford attempted the same in 1985, when they introduced a new brand called Mercure and its first model, the XR4 Ti. Mercure XR4 Ti from Germany. The idea came from Bob Lutz, a name you may recognize from his tenures at GM and Chrysler. But at the time, he was CEO of Ford of Europe, and more importantly, was a former executive at BMW. His idea was to take the successful Ford Sierra XR4i and adapt it to be sold in America. The name was changed to XR4 Ti, 
with the addition of the T signifying the turbocharger in the four-cylinder used for the U.S. market, as opposed to the Sierra's V6, which couldn't pass U.S. emission standards of the time. Although the look of the XR4TI was better accepted in Europe, it didn't fare as well in the eyes of American buyers. Only the coupe model was imported into the U.S., and yet the window design was more like a sedan, having both C and D pillars. Not to mention a double spoiler, which, considering the turbo four-cylinder only made 170 horsepower, probably wasn't all that necessary. So much so, that in later models it was simplified to just a single spoiler. With only one model at first, it was sold in Lincoln Mercury dealers, who had to take on the extra expense of marketing an entirely new brand for just one car, a brand whose name that pretty much no one in the U.S. could pronounce correctly. Mercury. A second Mercury model, the Scorpio, was introduced in 1987, but although being a more practical four-door sedan, its price was still higher than other Mercury models, even though its size and shape was very similar to Mercury Sables that were sitting alongside them in the same dealerships, but with the Sable costing nearly half the price. With so much mispronunciation of the Mercury name, Ford stopped marketing the XR4TI and Scorpio with the Mercury name by 1989, and the Mercury name started to disappear from Lincoln Mercury dealerships. A second generation Mercury would have been required to stay in compliance with American safety regulations, and with so few sold, there was no 1990 model. At least not in the US, as the Sierra and Scorpio models continued to sell in Europe well into the 90s. Having been the second new brand that was a complete failure for Ford, the first being the Edsel, Ford never again tried to introduce a new brand in the US market. Is that German for bad marketing concept? No. Number seven, the final generation of the Ford Thunderbird. From 1955 to 1997, over 10 generations, Ford sold the Thunderbird, which initially started as a two-seater convertible, meant to compete with the Chevy Corvette, that had launched two years earlier in 1953. But by its second generation, the Thunderbird grew a back seat to further increase its sales potential. Although it remained a two-door through most of its run, with the exception of a four-door option in the late 60s, its days were numbered by the 90s, when big coupes fell out of favor, resulting in its cancellation by 1997. However, the late 90s and early 2000s were also best known for retro styling, so Ford came up with an idea to resurrect the original Thunderbird convertible into a new halo car. Sharing nothing with its predecessor, the 2002 Thunderbird was based on a platform shared with then-subsidiary Jaguar. The same platform also underpinned the new Lincoln LS, Lincoln's first small sports sedan, and even the dashboard of the Thunderbird was taken from the LS making the inside completely mismatched from its retro-inspired exterior. Just like the original from 1955, this new T-Bird also offered a removable hardtop and could even be ordered with a rolling stand to store the top in your garage. Although Ford managed to sell over 31,000 T-Birds in 2002, that number dropped by over 50% the following year. To help boost sales, the T-Bird was featured in the James Bond film Die Another Day, and a special 007 edition was offered for 2003. Yet considering that movie wasn't exactly one of the best Bond films, the tie-in did little to improve overall sales. <laughs> By 2005, when less than 10,000 were sold, the T-Bird was quietly dropped. It still sells well today among older buyers, which was primarily all the buyers it had when it was new, and its retro exterior was really only appreciated by those who appreciated the original. Oh! Number 6, Eagle Medallion. Here's another example of one of the big three trying to introduce a new brand into their product portfolio. This time it was Chrysler, who in the mid-80s took over American Motors. So we're introducing the first new North American car brand in 30 years, Eagle. This move primarily was for their Jeep line, but Chrysler also got the Eagle name, which at the time was well known as one of AMC's best-selling SUVs. Which makes it all more odd that Chrysler decided to spin off a new brand of vehicles as Eagle, despite having none of the cars in the Eagle lineup having any resemblance to an SUV. One of the first cars was the Eagle Medallion, a car that came and went so quickly in Chrysler's lineup that you'd be excused for not even knowing it existed. In fact, you may instead remember it as the Renault Medallion, as that is what it originally was. It's the new Renault Medallion. In the final years of AMC, their name, American Motors, became a misnomer, considering that they were majority owned by French automaker Renault. As a result, many of AMC's final cars were Renault models, as was the Medallion, as it was based on the Renault 21 sold in Europe. With some re-engineering to make it legal for the North American market, the medallion was first introduced here in 1987, only days before the official sale of AMC to Chrysler was completed. As it was already branded as a Renault, Chrysler kept that name for the 1988 model year, but then rebranded it as the Eagle Medallion for 1989, as they launched their new Jeep Eagle division. 
but in those early days, it was clear that Chrysler was far more interested in the G products they got from AMC, as opposed to the Renault sedans, as the latter competed with models Chrysler already had. The resulting disinterest showed in terms of sales, as only around 25,000 were sold as either Renault or Eagle models before Chrysler pulled the plug at the end of the 1989 model year. They are all nearly gone today, and only serve as a reminder of an underappreciated stepchild Chrysler once had. Before I continue with the countdown, a quick word about today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. If you're a regular viewer of my channel, you may recall that my channel was hacked last year. What I didn't have back then was a VPN, or Virtual Private Network. A VPN creates a secure tunnel between your device and the internet. ExpressVPN protects you from hackers who want to steal your private information, no matter where you are, including public Wi-Fi networks while on the go. ExpressVPN reroutes 100% of your network traffic through their secure, encrypted servers. ExpressVPN also masks your device's unique IP address, making it much more difficult for advertisers to collect your data. ExpressVPN also allows you to access content that would otherwise be unavailable in your home country. Click my link in the description below to begin your trial of ExpressVPN and get your first three months free. Number five, the final generation of the Pontiac GTO. In 1999, Pontiac created a show car that they named the GTO as an homage to a name that had been missing from Pontiac's lineup since 1974. However, when the time came to bring back the GTO name on a production model, the end result looked nothing like the concept. That's because the new GTO was essentially a rebadged Monaro, built in Australia by GM's Holden division. The idea for importing a Holden model to the U.S. came from Bob Lutz, who was chairman of GM North America back then. With the recent loss of the Firebird, Pontiac had a hole in its lineup that the GTO could fill. However, like so many other examples in automotive history, bringing back an old nameplate in the hopes that nostalgia would translate to more sales didn't really work here. Launched in 2003 as a 2004 model, the launch of the GTO took far longer than Lutz had hoped, due to the autonomy Holden had compared to the rest of GM's global market. It also didn't help that the third generation Monaro was starting to look a bit dated. Monaro. Game over. And the resulting GTO landed in the U.S. with an unexpected thud. The GTO shared the same 5.7 liter LS1 V8 as the Corvette, which would have been unthinkable a few years earlier, as Chevrolet typically kept the best performance options with the Corvette. With this engine out of the hood, the GTO was a true sleeper, as its exterior styling was so bland and anonymous that it didn't shout muscle car like the original GTO once did. It also didn't help that many Pontiac dealerships initially charged markups on the car in the expectation that people would pay it. But by the end of that model year, they had to sell them at discounts, as they had over 2,000 cars imported for that year than they could sell before the 2005 model year started. Despite improving the engine to the LS2, making 400 horsepower, and adding a front hood scoop, sales never improved, and imports for the 2006 model year ended early in September of that year. Although the official reasoning for the cancellation was new airbag standards, which the current model didn't meet, it was obvious to all that low sales was the real reason. But the failure of the GTO didn't end the imports of Australian models, as later on the Pontiac G8, the Chevy Caprice PPV, and the Chevy SS would come stateside. Sadly, none of these models could even sell as well as the GTO. Number 4. Suzuki X90 Introducing the new 4x4 X90 from Suzuki. Here's another model that you may have not ever realized existed, as it came and went before most ever saw it on the road. And maybe being on this list is stretching the definition of a sports car, but it did only have two seats. The X90, which was released in 1995, was a replacement to the Suzuki Samurai, which was not available with a back seat starting in 1994, due to safety regulations that required back seats to have seat belts. Although thanks to consumer reports, which scared away many potential buyers with their claims that the Samurai was prone to rollovers, the Samurai sales had dropped so much by then that Suzuki needed a replacement anyway. However, the X90 proved to not be the best replacement. Using the same platform as a two-door version of the Suzuki Sidekick, which by the way was also used for the Geo Tracker, the X90 didn't have a completely removable top as the Sidekick offered, but instead had a T-top style roof and a small trunk behind the seats, which significantly limited its practicality. The target market for the X90 was intended for young people, but with only two seats, it only worked for young people with not a lot of friends. Its 95 horsepower four-cylinder was also in the sidekick, but while the latter worked well for off-road duties, the X90's off-road ability seemed to be limited just to the beach. Too bad it was too small to hold a surfboard. Suzuki only exported around 7200 X90s to the US, and the majority of those were sold in the first model year of 1996. Sales dropped off quickly after that with less than 500 sold in the final year of 1998. That same year, Suzuki introduced a new generation of the Sidekick with a new name, 
the Vitara, which proved to be a more popular vehicle. In fact, it's most popular through the 2000s. But the good times didn't last long, as Suzuki left the US and Canadian market in 2012. Check out my Suzuki episode to learn more. He's going off. Oh no! He got a catch! He missed the cameraman though, that's okay! Number 3. Buick Riata Although some may say that Buick has always had a reputation for being an old man's car, by the mid-80s, GM was ready to inject some excitement into the brand. The Riata was Buick's first two-seater, launched in early 1988 as a 1989 model, and was the first Buick to be built in a factory designated just for it, appropriately named the Riata Craft Center in Lansing, Michigan. Initially released as a coupe, a convertible version was available in 1990. But unlike a typical two-door sports car, the Riata was still designed around a typical Buick buyer, with a V6 that could only produce 170 horsepower, and with front-wheel drive. But hey, it had pop-up headlamps, so that was cool. But there was one feature of the Riata that definitely did not work for its older clientele. As the Riata shared a platform with the two-door Buick Riviera, it also shared some of the Riviera's interior, including a touchscreen to handle all the audio and climate controls. Buick considered this state-of-the-art for 1989, but for the over-65 crowd, they were less impressed. Hello, computer. Leading Buick to replace a touchscreen with a more conventional dashboard for 1990. The Riata Craft Center was designed around the expectation that Buick could sell 20,000 Riatas annually, hoping for the retired couples crowd to make up a majority of buyers. However, by 1991, Buick had only sold 21,000 in four years, leading to the Riata's cancellation. But it wasn't the end of the Riata Craft Center, as it was later renamed the Lansing Craft Center and was the home of GM's first modern-day electric car, the EV1, as well as other low-volume models, the last being the Chevy SSR. By the way, check out my first flops video to learn more about that one. Well, it's certainly no spring chicken, more like a spring onion. It stinks. Number 2. Saab 97X For anyone out there that is a serious fan of this former Swedish automobile manufacturer, vehicles such as this one are most likely on your list of cars that should be never discussed again. Some may say that it is true for any vehicle badge as a Saab that was built after 1989, when General Motors took 50% ownership, and even more so in 2000 when GM took over the remaining 50%. Although Saab would have likely folded if GM hadn't intervened, the end result was more and more Saabs looking a lot more like GM cars, because they really were GM cars. Although Saab models in the 2000s started sharing GM platforms, they had, for the most part, their own unique look that hid their GM underpinnings. This changed in 2005, when GM wanted to offer a replacement for the Oldsmobile Bravada, which was that brand's first and only SUV, killed off along with all of Oldsmobile in 2004. The last Bravada was based on the GMT 360 platform, which was shared with the Chevy Trailblazer, GMC Envoy, and even the Isuzu Ascender, as GM had a majority stake in Isuzu back then. And if that wasn't enough, even Buick had their own version, called the Rainier. All these models looked nearly identical to one another, except for different front and rear fascias. But with the loss of the Bravada, GM decided to fill that slot by creating the Saab 97X for 2005. And like all of its platform mates, it didn't take much looking to figure out the 97X wasn't really born from jets, as the Saab advertising used to say back then. Saab, born from jets. Although Oldsmobile definitely wasn't GM's top luxury brand, this replacement for the Bravada would become GM's second most expensive luxury SUV, only behind the Cadillac Escalade. But although the Escalade was able to win over buyers despite being a rebadged Chevy Tahoe, it was harder to win over Saab loyalists to buy the 97X. Much of Saab's original clientele had left by this point, resulting in the best sales year of 2006 having only 5,500 sold. By 2008, GM offered the 97X with the Aero Trim package, a name used on high-performance Saabs of years past, with the previous model year Corvette's LS2 V8. GM considered this Aero option a limited-time offer, as the entire GMT 360 platform was to be discontinued following that plant closure in 2008. This plan, as well as GM's bankruptcy, which led to them giving up Saab, made it a safe bet that the 97X was never to return. If you are a fan of the 97X, let us know in the comments, but expect to have some responses simply asking why. Before I get to number one, let me know of other cars I could use for another flops list, including cars that didn't make it on this list because they weren't luxury or sports cars. So for those of you who keep asking why I didn't include the Pontiac Aztec here, send me suggestions for other non-luxury or non-sports cars to fill a list that the Aztec could be on, maybe even make it to number one. Remember, the car needed to be in production any time between 1980 and 2005 to be included. Well, first I had to find a Pontiac dealership, which wasn't easy. And if you're wondering why the Plymouth Prowler didn't make this list, watch my last Flops episode to find out why. Number 1. Cadillac Cimarron So although this car actually sold far more units than most cars on this list, over 130,000, 
Well, sales aren't everything. There is also a commitment to the brand's legacy, and the Cimarron was the biggest miscalculation Cadillac ever made. The late 70s brought on a second gas crisis, and Cadillac had a hard enough time making it through the first one. Cadillac dealers were clamoring for a smaller model that would be more fuel efficient and bring in younger buyers. Around that same time, GM was working on a new compact car line that would be known as the J Platform. Bigger than Chevette, smaller than Citation. This was the height of GM's rebadging, as Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, and Buick would all have models that shared the J Platform, and they all looked basically the same, except for different front and rear ends. The Cimarron would offer most all options from the other cars as standard, as well as leather seats, but cost nearly twice as much. A new Cadillac! With just 11 months before the J-Car line was to hit showrooms, the directive from corporate came down to come up with a Cadillac model using the same platform, but they could only change the front and rear ends, just like the four other models. Despite the extremely short timetable, Cadillac's marketing team still found time to make this film showing their designers hard at work designing the Cimarron, which when watched today, is both funny and sad at the same time. During its first model year of 1982, the marketing didn't include the name Cadillac, or instead would be called the Cimarron by Cadillac. Even the Cadillac badging was missing the first year, and even after that was kept to a minimum, almost as if they weren't proud of this car being part of the Cadillac family. The Cimarron did manage to bring down Cadillac's average buyer age, but it also set some new records that Cadillac wasn't real proud of, such as being the first Cadillac since 1914 to have a four-cylinder engine, and the smallest displacement since 1908. By 1985, a V6 was available, as well as a new front end that made it look a little bit less like a Cavalier. But despite these improvements, it was still laughable compared to its intended competition, the BMW 3 Series. Yes, that is what GM had expected the Cimarron to compete with. Needless to say, it didn't come close. By 1988, sales had averaged between 10,000 and 20,000 per year weren't enough to justify its continued production. In fact, by that point, the Oldsmobile J car, the Forenza, was dropped and the Buick Skyhawk was dropped a year later. Cadillac never offered a direct replacement, as by 1988, the gas crisis had subsided, eliminating the need for such a cheap, fuel-efficient car in their lineup. The next closest car Cadillac offered would arrive a few years later, the first car in this flops list. I guess they didn't learn, did they? Thanks for watching. If you like this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. If you once owned a car from the 80s to mid-2000s that you rarely see today and would like it featured in a future episode, Leave a reply in the comments or contact me at the email shown here. See you next time. Get me out of here. <laughs>